First Peter, as we know, talks about the persecution of Christians who were scattered abroad. And he wrote them this letter to comfort them, to encourage them, to give them insight. And we know that Christians are persecuted all around the world today, in different parts of the world. Some are actually killed and tortured, houses confiscated, families torn apart. Uh, in our country, uh, very often uh, things are said about us. Uh, Ten Commandment uh, monuments are torn away and uh, different, different things. Didn't get that job. Um, ignored in different ways because we're Christians. We're suffering that kind of uh, persecution. Uh, God is able. God is able. And we're taking a stand. Uh, someone may not like you because you're a Christian, uh, because you believe in Jesus. You may lose friends. You may even lose family. Uh, because you're a Christian, and take a strong uh, stand for Jesus Christ and this godless culture in which we live. So in, in the first century here, Peter writes to believers scattered abroad and trying to encourage them uh, with the words that God had given him for them, and they certainly are an encouragement for us. And we want to look at them in First Peter as we'll move through this fairly quickly. And, and yet gain some insight, how I can be strong, how, I, how can I live for God uh, in a godless generation? Or how about how can I endure suffering? Or even the chastisement of God. Uh, God spanks his children. God judges the church. He cleanses the church. Doesn't condemn it, uh, but he does judge it, that we might be holy, spotless, blameless. And we'll be talking about that. All right, looking at 1 Peter 4 then, you notice I entitled this, The Same Way of Thinking. And you might say, well, what? what's that about? The Same Way of Thinking. We're just simply saying that we are to look at trials and difficulties and sufferings, by the way, some we bring upon ourselves, by having the same way of thinking that Christ had about them. That's what we want today. How can I look at the sufferings in this present life that I go through, at the trials, at the difficulties that I go through, even at God's chastising hand when I need to be chastised and disciplined as a loving father does for his children? How can I look at it from the mind of Christ the same way Christ would look at it? Well, we're going to look at these areas, and I think they'll be helpful. See, the problem we have thinking about difficulties and trials and suffering from a purely human point of view drags us down. Because when we think of the difficulty we go, we go through, the trials we go through, and so on, we can get pretty discouraged. We can get down. But as we see them through the mind of Christ, from his way of thinking his point of view, his purpose, all of a sudden, these trials, these difficulties, these sufferings we go through take on meaning, take on purpose. There's a real reason behind them, and we're going to look at that. Okay, first of all, as we look at this section in 1 through 3, the first point we want to look at is to seize from practicing Sinful behavior, to seize from, practical, uh, from practicing sinful behavior. Look at what it says. Follow along again, one through three. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has seized from sin, so as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. All that good stuff, right? That the world is so involved in. But it says we used to be that way. You notice it says in verse 1 that we are to arm ourselves. What? With the thinking of Christ with the purpose of Christ, with the mindset of Christ. Let this mind be in you, the Bible says, that was 
and is in Christ Jesus. And it goes on, who suffered in the flesh, whoever has suffered in the flesh has seized from sin. When we learn discipline, when we are suffering, when we go through difficulties, and we give ourselves to God in all of this, we will indeed depend upon Him in those times of trial and sin less and less. We don't become sinless uh, this side of glory, but as we trust Him, we will sin less and less. That's called sanctification, becoming more like Jesus every day. You might want to look at last year. How much did I become like Jesus last year? You know, and compared to this year, how am I doing this year? Any improvements? But not only that, as we arm ourselves with the same way of thinking, for whoever has suffered in the flesh has seized from sin. But for what reason? Look at verse 2. So as to live the rest of the time in our bodies, in our flesh, no longer for the human passions we used to live for. So we don't make sin a habit anymore. We don't do intentional sins like we used to. Why? Because now I want to live for God. Now I want to do His will. My purpose in life is to do the will of God. Now you tell that to an unbelieving friend, it'll drive him crazy. They'd say, what? What are you talking about? Because their purpose in life usually is to have money in their pocket, to have a beautiful house, car, family. All of these things are great. But to do the will of God? I don't know. That just doesn't fit in the picture. You see, God is just an appendage there. If I've got time for him, maybe I'll give him a thought. But most of the time, I'm just centered in my life, what I'm doing. But no, we cease from intentional sin, from a sinful lifestyle, so that we might live the rest of our life that we have left to do the will of God, not to gratify the passions of our flesh. We've changed. We're no longer the same. And you know what? It says in verses 4 and 5 that our friends that we used to chum out with and do these things with, and some of them may not have been as drastic as some on the list, but, you know, we do questionable things, get a little high, have a good time, don't do anything really bad. You know, we're not robbing banks or killing people, but the things we know, you know, ought not to be done, and there's something inside us that says it's not right, but now we say, you know what, I can't do that anymore. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to live for the Lord. And, you know, your friends look at you and they're amazed What's happening to you, man? You're not the same person you used to be when we used to hang out together. What has happened to you? They're amazed. But you know what? It's not a good amazement on their part. They don't like the changes they see. They don't like the way you now speak and talk and act. They don't like the fact that you love reading God's Word and going to church and living for the will of God. Oh, boy, one of those holy rollers Bible-thumping people you become. They don't like that. So you know what they do? According to these verses 4 and 5, what they did then, they do now. They malign you. They make fun of you. They call you names. That's how they get their kicks. They start saying bad things about you because, man, what you're doing is weird. You are strange in their eyes. Yeah. Some of you maybe today have experienced that. I have. I've lost friends. Maybe some of you, maybe even family. And Christ said he came to divide family sometimes. We have sons and daughters and believers and parents aren't, or vice versa. Some, some of the family members can't take it. It's too much. So you've been brainwashed. And I love to say when they say that, yes, we've all been brainwashed in one way or the other. My brain has been washed by the blood of the Lamb. What has your brain been washed by? The fact is, the world and its values. Okay. And then as we move on in this text, it says, Though we are now judged, we all will enjoy the presence of God. They're going to judge us for the weird behavior. Uh, in some lands of the world today, they're judged, they're killed, they're hung, they're shot. 
They're cut into pieces. They're tortured. But you know, the good news is even though they are judged, God says they will be with him forever. They will have eternal life. You see, this life is not all there is. And if it was, man, we're in sad shape. If Christ is for this life only, Paul says, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ is not only for this life. He's here with us and he indwells us through the Holy Spirit. And he's waiting for us in heaven. And he's reserved a place for us. We have friends and family who have gone before waiting for us as well. But what a wonderful thing. What a wonderful truth. So that's the good news as we look at that. Though we will be judged, that's all right. We're going to be with the Lord, and that's a sure thing. So we seize, now that we know the Lord, we seize from practicing intentional sin. Still going to sin, but intentional sin, the way we used to. Secondly, we pray love and serve one another even in our trials, even in our difficulties and suffering. We pray, love, and serve one another in our sufferings, trials, and difficulties. Look at 7. There are 11 there. It talks about it. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all things, keep on loving one another earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sin, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Beautiful. As we look at that, It tells us in these times that we live in, in the times they lived in, when they were going through suffering, when they were going through difficulties and persecution, he said we must keep on praying. Keep on praying. You notice it says in verse 7, be self-controlled and sober-minded. This is a very serious time in which we live. Be self-controlled, doing God's will every day. Sober-minded, thinking the thoughts of Christ. For the sake of your prayers, we want to be clear-minded as we pray, self-control, serious about our prayers. How many of us spend time in prayer every day? And there's so much to pray about, right? But oh, that time in prayer is so needed when we're going through uh, sufferings and difficulties and trials, and even when we're not, you know, praying every day. And there's always something to pray about We're called to be praying people. Someone has said, if we're not praying Christians, we're playing Christian. If we're not praying Christians, we're playing Christian. We need to be praying every day. And they knew it then. And boy, there's nothing that helps us through difficulties and trials and sufferings like prayer does. And I want to say prayer based upon God's word. Have you ever prayed the Bible? Take a portion of Scripture and prayed it up to God. It's a wonderful way of praying uh, along with other ways because God always honors His Word. So taking a Scripture and turning it into a prayer is a wonderful thing. Secondly, it says in the area of uh, love and service, servicing one another with, uh, with love. Keep, we must keep on loving. Eight and nine. Uh, What did Jesus say? By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you gripe, if you complain. No, if you love one another. And he tells us here, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that true? Uh, Loving one another from the heart earnestly covers a multitude, a whole bunch of sins. Uh, Indeed. So it goes on to say, showing hospitality, another way of expressing love, showing hospitality to one another without grumbling, having a good attitude. Not because hospitality is something that we have to do, but something we enjoy doing. You know, Mary and Martha invited Jesus 
over the house, I'm sure, more than once. And uh, we see many examples of that. Hospitality, good, godly, Christian hospitality is such a blessing. It's a way of showing love for one another when you open your heart and you open your home. So we need to keep praying uh, in these days. We need to keep loving one another and then keep serving one another. Look at verses 10 and 11. We are to serve one another by using the gifts we have. Whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God. So if God has given you uh, a place where you're speaking the word of God, speak it as the word of God. Speak it as the word of God. Whoever serves, if God has given you the gift of service, uh, serving others serves by the strength that God supplies. God will give you strength. See, whatever God gives you a gift for, he'll give you the strength to exercise that gift, the ability to exercise that gift. And every Christian has gifts. Every Christian has gifts. And this is a service gift, the one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Why? In order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. When we use our gifts, when we serve one another, when we keep on praying, when we keep on loving, we give glory to God in times of difficulties and trials and the things we go through. You know, I just love that. I, I, I love to see Christians in good times, the difficult times, they just keep on serving. They keep, keep on trusting. They keep on following Christ in an unwavering manner. They say, Lord, help me to be like that. How I be as steady as a rock. No matter what comes my way, I'm going to serve you no matter what. So we're called to pray, to love, to serve one another in our times of suffering and trials and difficulties in verses 7 through 11. And then thirdly, we can be reassured in our trials and sufferings. We can be reassured in our trials, difficulties, and sufferings, 12 through 16. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial that comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when he's revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Wow. How beautiful is that? How beautiful is that? We have reassurance when we're serving God in difficult times. We're not to be surprised, it says, at the trials that come upon us and say, boy, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through these difficult times? Why am I being persecuted? Uh, why am I having uh, all kinds of suffering that seem to be coming upon? Don't be surprised as though some strange thing were happening to you. But instead, rejoice when we share Christ's sufferings, because you say, Lord, through this suffering, and some of this we bring upon ourselves, right? Through our sin and bad behavior, yes. Our Heavenly Father spanks us because He loves us, He disciplines us. But others comes outside. We can't help it from the outside upon us. And we go through trials, we go through difficulties, we go through sufferings. But we're to rejoice when we share Christ's sufferings because say, Lord, I'm going to have the same kind of mind you have about this. I'm going to think the same way you think about this. I'm going to have the same purpose in my difficulties and trials and sufferings that you have to honor and please the Father and to give glory to his name. That's why James could say, count it all joy when you go through various trials. He didn't say if you go through various trials. He says when you go through various trials. Because we all will. There's no ifs about it. We all will. Doesn't matter how nice and wonderful and altogether a person may look. Believe me, 
they're going to go through trials. They're going to go through difficulties. Even though they may seem to have it all together, no, no. They will go through trials and difficulties and hardships and sufferings like anybody else. But the thing is, do they have the Savior? That's what counts. Do they know the Lord? Are they trusting in Him? Can they have the same view of difficulties and suffering and hardships that Christ has? That's what we're talking about here, that we can as believers. We suffer as Christians. Now, it says now we're not to suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer, a meddler. None of these things. We're not to suffer. These things are behind us. But when we do suffer, we're to suffer for doing good. Remember, we said that last week. Suffer as a Christian and not be ashamed of it. But I want to glorify God. In the name of Christ, I'm not ashamed. Let's turn to Acts chapter 5. We see an example of this. In Acts chapter 5, where the apostles were preaching very openly, very boldly about Jesus. In Acts chapter 5, 40 through 42... And they couldn't stand it. Even today, if someone's out there preaching boldly about Jesus, there's always someone who wants to stop them. Always someone who wants to shut them up, keep them quiet, get them in a church building. I don't want them out here in public. Keep your religion to yourself. Keep your Jesus to yourself. You want to talk about the Bible? Fine. Go in your own church building. But we don't want it out in the public square. We don't want others to hear it. We're not interested. Ah, uh, that's not so. Jesus said the fields are white for harvest. There are many who are interested and want to hear because they're down, they're depressed, they're despondent. Some are even thinking of ending their life. We want to share the good news. Look at verse 40 of, of chapter 5 of Acts. And the apostles were openly preaching the gospel. And it says, when they had called the apostles, the religious authorities, they beat them. Huh, nice thing, right? They beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now, do you think the apostle said, man, oh, man, I'm achy all over. I've got bruises. After that beating, that's, that's it, man. I'm not going to speak about Jesus anymore. That's it. I've had it, you know. I mean, how many times do I have to go to the hospital? But it says, as we read on, and then they left the presence of the consul rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. Isn't that amazing? They rejoiced that they were able, counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. We are assured in times of suffering and difficulty and hardship, whatever it is, of His power, His presence with us, and we're not ashamed, but we glorify God in that name. Fourthly, God cleanses and judges his church through trials and difficulties and suffering. Let's look at verses 17 and 18 of our text. For the time for judgment is to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? The time for judgment for the church has come. It'll begin with us. God will begin with us. God chastens and purifies and judges his church, but he doesn't condemn his church. But he judges and purifies. Why is that? Because God wants a pure, holy church. We read in Ephesians, Jesus wants to present the church, his bride, to himself without spot or wrinkle, that the church might be holy and without blemish. Dear friends, and it begins with you and me. Are we living holy lives, lives without sin, lives without blemish? Are we living those kind of lives before God on a daily basis. Now, if God's going to deal with the church that way and cleanse his church and purify his church, imagine the unbeliever. 
Imagine the one who doesn't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. If the righteous are just just saved through the difficulties and trials and troubles and hardships they go through, how will God deal with unbelievers? Dear friends, they're lost. And they're on their way to a Christless eternity. And that should concern us about our families, our friends, our relatives, our co-workers, our classmates, that they are literally on their way to hell. And once they leave this life, that's it. There is no second chance. And that should give us a concern and a compassion for them to share the gospel with them. See, that's why Billy Graham preached with such urgency all through his ministry, because he knew that people were dying daily, going to a Christless eternity. And many of these religious people who thought they could earn their way to heaven, who were good in their own eyes but never trusted Christ and Him alone and received that free gift of eternal life. That's why he preached so fervently. And dear friends, you and I who bear the gospel, who are Christians, God's going to purge and cleanse his church. But he also wants his church to be telling the gospel, the good news to those who don't obey the gospel, who are perishing. Dear friends, how are we doing at that? How are we doing? Finally, we are to entrust ourselves to a faithful creator, even as we suffer. Look at verse 19. Therefore, let, it, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. But that's what it's all about, right? When we go through hardships and sufferings, we remember who created us. And we remember that he is faithful who created us. And that as we go through difficulties and hardships and trials and sufferings, we can entrust our souls to Him. We can lean on Him. Remember that song, Lean on Me? We can lean on Him. And no better person to lean on than Jesus, than God. You see, because He can take the weight. He can take the burden. We can't. So, a wonderful principle there. We can entrust our souls to a faithful Creator even as we suffer. But you notice at the end of the verse it says, entrust ourselves to a faithful creator while doing good. Keep on doing good. Keep on serving, but keep on resting in the Lord. I always love that because when we entrust ourselves on the Lord, we can be busy but resting. All the world around us can be swirling around us in wild fury, but we have rested in him, we are trusting in him, and we can have peace. Just like that illustration of Niagara Falls, it's the huge raw, I don't know if any of you have seen Niagara Falls, but we've been there two, three times, and the mighty power of those falls, but the illustration is given of a little, under the falls there's a little, little tree growing with a little bird just resting so peacefully. Uh, amid the roar of those falls, that little bird's just resting in the nest so peacefully. And this is what he wants us to do, to entrust our souls to him. So to wind it up, what are we saying? In, in terms of our trials and difficulties and sufferings, we are to cease from practicing sin intentionally as a lifestyle. We no longer live for that. Now we live for the will of God. And listen, expect to be judged by others when you live for Jesus. You can expect it is normal, is natural. But one day you're going to enjoy God's presence forever. What are we to be doing? The big three there. Keep on praying, keep on loving, and keep on serving. Isn't that great? Full service Christians, keep on praying and loving and serving. Uh, we're going to suffer and go through trials as Christians, but we're not to suffer doing wrong. We're to suffer as a Christian and even glory in that name, as the apostles did. Indeed, that we were counted worthy to suffer for Jesus. And we said before, hey, listen, God cleanses, God purges, and God disciplines His church. 
and that means each one of us personally is a part of his church, why that one day Jesus is going to present the church to himself as a bride without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. Indeed. And as we said, we are to entrust ourself, our souls, unto a faithful creator. He created us, and he's faithful. We can trust him. So as we do these things, we have the very same thinking and purpose and mind and attitude of Christ in our sufferings and trials and difficulties. And you know what that means? That means, dear friends, you and I can live a full, abundant life as we go through this life, even in trials and difficulties and sufferings. I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, not only in the good times, but in all times in our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, may we take to heart these truths about suffering for you through our trials and our difficulties. As we said, even some we brought upon ourselves. But Lord, we can be victorious as we arm ourselves with that same way of thinking that your son has. And we can live that full and abundant life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.